this part of our program is being broadcast throughout ABC on the different monitors throughout the campus. And it's because of the special nature of this part of the program that we're inviting a special guest to talk to us about a very important project in Egypt uh, these days, and one in which many of us look forward with tremendous optimism. Dr. Ahmad Darwish is a member of our advisory board. He's also a member of the advisory board of the business school. Yes. Uh, he's a former minister uh, in government. He's uh, an expert uh, very much in uh, how to deal with the public service, uh, the public sector in, uh, in Egypt, especially the uh, civil sector. Uh, and I've had the pleasure and the honor of knowing him for a number of years uh, so if, I, if it allows me, I consider him to be a friend and, sure. uh, and I admire much of his work, which is always rational, uh, straightforward, and very candid. Uh, he, because of his past expertise, because of his, uh, the integrity that uh, he, he brings to many of his projects, he's been mandated by the president to chair one of the most important projects we have in Egypt as we look forward, how to develop the Suez Canal area particularly in the new developed areas. And what I'd like to do is to invite Dr. Darwish to make his presentation, uh, which as I said, will be broadcast. After that, you'll have an opportunity to ask him questions, uh, which he has agreed to answer. So let me simply stop there, and thank you, Dr. Darwish, for being with thank us. You. And you have the floor, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, actually, for this kind invitation and giving me the opportunity to address this elite group and the rest of the uh, student body, if they are interested to watch. I'm not sure how many of them are, uh, are interested. Uh, I would like to apologize for uh, using a, a non, uh, very famous font because uh, uh, they decided to do the presentation from the laptop of the school, not from my laptop, and apparently I've used a phone that is not existing, so some of the writings are not going to be uh, very clear. For example, this is supposed to be agenda. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I will, uh, what I will try to do is I'll try to raise more questions, uh, you know, as much question as I can. So I'll give a, you know, brief background of what we are trying to do. And uh, I hope that the interactive part of the question answer will, uh, will bring me lots of your experience to take into consideration. I'll give you a glimpse of history, tell you what we'd like to do, the legal framework, and, uh, and then I'll talk about the current phase of, uh, of the Suez Canal Economic Zone and uh, what we try to, and I'll give three examples from uh, this uh, current phase. Uh, history actually dates in 1976, where someone uh, came to President Sadat, you know, and said uh, Hong Kong might be coming back to China in 1999, and we have 10 big Chinese companies that are willing to locate in the Suez Canal zone, and uh, because they would like to sort of plan for the future. That was late 76. Unfortunately, the January 77 uh, events actually changed things and it did not work. But it was always a dream for Egyptians. How come we are not using the land on both sides of this waterway to make a value add and we are just, you know, uh, using the Suez Canal as just a, a place where ships pass? In 1998, um, in the 90s, the idea resurfaced. In 1998, they took a big piece of land in Sokhna and divided it into f two, four pieces and gave it to four of the largest investors in Egypt, four big investors, and asked them to develop it. But actually, uh, you know, those who even got it, it was a 40, uh, 40 square kilometers, quite, a, uh, quite a, an ambitious plan. Um, put that in prospect, Jabal Ali is 47 square kilometers. So 40 square kilometers in 98 was really something. Uh, you know, the best investor was able actually out of his 10 million square meters to develop something around 69, 70,000 meters. Uh, in 2002, they recognized that, no, we really need to have a, a legislation framework for that. And uh, one of, the, uh, of the, those who drafted the 2002 law is around this table. We thank her for doing, uh, for doing that. In 2003 was version one, which was a small, uh, a small zone on a 20 square kilometer piece of land. 
but who was isolated and did not have a port. We learned a lot between 2003 and 2015. In 2015, the law was modified one more time, and this time, instead of a 20 square kilometer with no ports, we are much bigger, much larger. I'm going to show you soon uh, how we are. What's the objective? The objective, of course, is what everyone is aspiring to all over the world to try to attract investment. I would like to say I am a conducive environment. I can make fast decisions. I am not bureaucratic and so on. So we are most, more or less trying to claim what others, what others are doing. But due to the nature of the law, we could really deli deliver on that. Because uh, basically, uh, specifically if you're interested in the uh, details, Article 13 of the law states that the Board of Directors of the zone is given all the power and authority that is vested in Egyptian laws that is given to ministers, governors, chairmen of authorities, and others. I mean, they were afraid that when they mentioned these three, they have missed something, then they said others. So basically, this economic zone is totally independent, is autonomous. The board of directors, they don't need to go back. It's the sole governance body of the zone. We don't need to go back to the cabinet in any of our decisions. Uh, when a project is, uh, is proposed to us, we take a decision regarding the environmental impact assessment study. We don't have to send this environment impact assessment study to the Ministry of Environment. We can have our own consultants who would take a decision on that. Uh, the, uh, the fun uh, thing I always mention to people because lots of, uh, you know, there are lots of, complain of complaints about education in Egypt. We're allowed in the zone to give license to build a school without going back to the Ministry of Education. This is how powerful our board can be. So uh, uh, the board is, the con you know, the composition of the board is also uh, a very positive indicator. We have a board of nine members, four represent government and five represent the private sector. So even the design of the board is such that, that the independent uh, votes override, can overrule uh, the, government, uh, the government votes. Uh, we have, uh, uh, our board members come from investment banking background, from industry, from trade, from, from legal uh, background. We don't really need to talk about something that everybody is talking about when we talk about one-stop shop. We don't even mention that because we are truly one stop. When the board of directors approves something, uh, registration of a company is done in the zone. We have our own commercial registry. Licenses are, all licenses are given by that. We award uh, the land. So you come to one place, we, we, you always talk about one stop shop when you have different entities and you'd like to make an interface to these different entities. And the problem with one-stop shop in Egypt was always that this one-stop is acting as a postman. They take the paperwork and they run, you know, to try to get these approvals from different places. As if the problem actually that the investor does not find the parking spot for his car, so say, come and park over here, we'll do it on your behalf. But this is not the case, because when you come to the headquarters of the, of the zone, this is where all decision is taken. So... Uh, you, get your, you, you do a registration, you get your licenses, we, do, we give building permits, it's not municipalities. So it's truly by the nature of the law, we are one-stop shop, so we don't talk about that. We are a free zone, so there are no customs in the zone. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, there is no customs on the value add. So if you are exporting to Egypt, there is one more extra advantage that you know, you have the advantage of being in a free zone, and at the same time, you have the advantage of being in Egypt. Uh, so, for example, if you are exporting to Egypt, which, is, uh, which looks like, you know, a very strange term, you are exporting to Egypt, you only pay customs on the ingredients, not the full assembled, uh, not the, 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 value, the value add. So, if you are assembling a car in our zone, and you export this car to Egypt, you don't pay customs on the car, you pay customs on whatever from this car you have imported and used in, 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 your, uh, in your assembly. But we are a tax zone. We don't have that, but we have a 22.5% corporate tax, which we are actually studying and see to see how, uh, what's the effect on that on the, uh, 
uh, compared to it. What are the activities that we do? We are entitled to all the regulatory policies and regulatory activities in the zone. So we put our own policies and regulatory framework. As I mentioned, we do the registration and licensing. We are responsible for the infrastructure, not necessarily doing it ourselves. We outsource most of it in terms of uh, uh, power and water and uh, water treatment and the like. We're allowed to invest. So as, a, as an economic zone, we could actually uh, sort of, uh, in partnership with other people, uh, establish companies and, and work. This is actually sometimes give, gives our partners a little bit of uh, a relaxing nature in terms of sharing, uh, sharing uh, the risk. Uh, we are allowed to, uh, to manage our ports. We own six ports, as I'm going to show in, in phase one, so we can manage our ports. And to give a full good experience to whoever is locating in the zone, uh, we have our own tax office. So we collect the taxes on behalf of the Egyptian government so that uh, um, uh, you, they don't have to deal with the tax authority. Last but not least, we don't have this up and running yet, but we are all by the law to have a dispute resolution center for those who would like to go through dispute resolution rather than going to the uh, court uh, system. What's the current phase? The current phase is 461 square kilometers and six ports. Um, to put this in perspective, 461 square kilometers is two-thirds of Singapore, and it's 10 times Jabal Ali. I mentioned Jabal Ali is 47 square kilometers, and six ports. So we are very asset-rich. We tend to think that the location uh, and the ambition plan we have should put us to play along this big league. Uh, what I have on this map, starting from the uh, uh, far east, this is the Chinese triangle, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Shenzhen. You go a little bit south, there is Singapore. You come to the Middle East, there is Dubai and Jabal Ali. You go to, to Europe, it's Rotterdam and Hamburg, and in the Americas, it's Panama. So there are something like 3,500 3, uh, economic and industrial zones all over the world. Uh, special economic zones are over 300, which like, but the big ones, those are the big players, and this is where the Suez Canal deserves to be playing, you know. Yes, we talk a lot about the location, but, you know, if we enjoy the location, let's get the, the rest ready to be a player among uh, this league. It looks to us that we have all the right ingredients. This cake needs to be baked and put in the oven, and we really need to do, uh, to do that. Uh, here is the map. Uh, going from north to south, our first port is West Empur Said port and then East Empur Said port, and the, ver and the first piece of land we have is in Eastern of Empur Said. Uh, the second piece of land we have is in West Kantara. The third one is in East Ismailia. And the fourth and the largest one is in Sokhna, along with two more ports, Sokhna port and Adabeya port. We have two more ports, Tor, which is somewhere over here, and Arish, which is uh, somewhere uh, uh, over here. Uh, this is phase one, and it's by all means uh, a, very, a very ambitious plan. There was a master plan that was done during the 2015. A glimpse of that was, uh, was announced in March, and it was done in, uh, in, in November. Uh, based on this master plan, we have now a better understanding about uh, how much power and utilities, connectivity, and so on. We still need to drill further on this master plan, but at least we are we're not working from a white piece of paper. I'm going to skip that because I tend to think that the question and answer are much valuable than the slides. This is the domain where we could be clearly players. We could be players in the Mediterranean with the northern part, with the eastern per side, specifically we could be and yeah there are lots of rising uh, zones in the in the Mediterranean but we tend to think that we can compete first I mean, we have uh, we have Piraeus in Greece we have uh, Azmir not really but and then we have Tanja in in, in, in in Morocco but we could be an excellent player in the Mediterranean if we combine what we have in terms of, uh, in terms of ports and land with a, a couple of uh, airports, 
uh, that are nearby, we could actually serve Eastern Europe and we could serve Eastern Africa. Um, Djibouti, of course, is rising. Djibouti has nothing, you know, uh, more than what could Sokhna offer because there are no roads yet. So, uh, yes, they might be in the competition, but for the time being, they don't have, except for Ethiopia, they don't have any, any value add of, uh, of what we have. Needless to mention that we are the main player for Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, because this is where actually lots of the uh, big market for uh, either Far East or European uh, companies is. And if they are looking for their next expansion, I don't think they will ever locate their factories somewhere over here, because they could build the factory, they could put the machines and the robots, but they will, not also, they will need also need to, uh, to import the, uh, the, uh, the employees. And this is what, what we are capitalizing on. So basically, our message when we are going around the world is that, you know, give us a chance on your next expansion. If you are comparing two locations, just get us to be the third location you are comparing to, and we are sure we are going to stand to the, uh, to the competition because, because of the following. And this is what I'm going to show. I'm going to give three examples from those uh, seven zones I mentioned, Western Persaid, Eastern Persaid, Kantara, Ismailia, Sokhna, Tora, Narish. I'll give three examples of those seven locations. Uh, the East Persaid, the Kantara, and uh, uh, the Sokhna. But let me warn you that each of one, and this is our advantage, that each of these zones has a totally different flavor and a different style from the other zone. And this is giving us the advantage that we can serve different backgrounds, different sectors, and different, uh, different styles. Of course, they are not all at the same readiness also, because, for example, Sokhna is ready for you tomorrow to build your factory. We have the power, we have the water, we have everything. Eastern Persaid is still under preparation, but anyway, this uh, diversity that we have in the zone is guarantees that somebody sitting with us, his business is going to fall somewhere. And I'm actually, you know, the term fall in English is also used to fall in love. So let's hope that this will be true. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the eastern uh, Persaid zone, one of my three examples. North is in this direction, except, you know, the map was a little bit large to put upside down. This is the approach channel, which was done um, a month ago. It was done early February. Uh, and uh, the, the, now this approach channel was very important because it makes the port a 24 by 7 port. It used actually that uh, ships and vessels coming into the port, they will wait in line in the queue of the ships that are going into the Suez Canal. Now actually to go in and out of the port, you don't need to wait for those who are going into the Suez Canal. This is the port. This terminal is, is up and running. This is a terminal that is already working. It's a container terminal. It's operated by AP Moller for Mersic. We are building two more terminals, constructing two more terminals. This one over here, which is a container terminal, and we are currently uh, negotiating with Port of Singapore Authority for the operation of that terminal. And another terminal over here, which would likely be Partly could be a Roro terminal, roll on, roll off for cars, and we have a MOU. Uh, of course, it's not binding, but at least we know that Toyota is studying to have a Roro terminal over here, and the rest of it could either be a liquid bulk or a solid, a solid bulk. Uh, why are we negotiating with Port of Singapore Authority? Because basically, we'd like to build our reputation. We, we tend to think that Eastern Perseid is going to be the rising star in the Mediterranean. And I claim that I would like to make it the number one port of the world. I know what are our capabilities. We'll never be the number one port of the world soon in terms of how many containers we are handling, because we're far, far from that, because you know, uh, some of those uh, are, are handling 32 million terminals. But we could be the number one terminal in terms of efficiency. So at least let's get the title in something. Yes, we, this is actually a white piece of paper. This is a new terminal that's being constructed. There is no reason that we don't use the latest technology, the best work cycles, and the most efficient uh, way of doing, of doing things. And we can get that title. I'm challenging my team in terms of 
how many minutes it will take the container from the terminal to the industrial zone. How many minutes, not how many hours. We are a free zone. We have asked customs to go out of the land. Thank you very much, you know. Uh, it has been a pleasure knowing you, but this is no longer an entrance to Egypt. Entrance to Egypt is somewhere over here, so move out. So if we have no customs, then all what we need to check when the container is going down, and this could be done actually in lots of electronic ways now, if you have drugs or you have explosives. And this actually goes very fast through one of the machines and the thermal. Most of these are registered already. The container is registered before it arrives to the zone. The gray zone is actually uh, in the master plan designated to be logistic uh, activities. And the purple zone is, going, is uh, designated to be industrial activities. And then we have two more zones over here for housing. The reason for that, that somewhere over here to the east, the state is constructing a new city that is expected to have one million inhabitants by 2050. But actually, until this is done, we really need to have housing for, to serve the zone because West and Port Said is very small and will not accommodate um, those workers that are working over here. Uh, to facilitate the connectivity with inland, there, are, there is actually three tunnels that are being constructed over here. Two tunnels for vehicles, one going uh, west-east, two lanes cars, one, another one going east-west, two lanes cars, and a third tunnel for uh, a dual track uh, rail road. Uh, activities that are expected to be over here are actually medium to light industries because the soil actually over here is, is a mushy soil, needs soil enhancement. It cannot actually take uh, heavy industries. Heavy industries are directed to be in, in soft. What you see over here is part of what we have learned between 2003 and 2015 is that the zone has to be connected directly to the port because being away from the port creates lots of bureaucracy in terms of I am a free zone, so I'm sitting at the port, I'm saying this container is going to the free zone, how do I guarantee that it goes there, you pay me some, uh, some guarantee and so on. So this makes it this integration. What we're looking over here actually, and this is the second drilling on the, on the master plan, is that we are currently in the next two weeks inviting six or seven of the consulting firms and so on to uh, revise where is the competitive edge of Egypt in terms of the industries that we will invite. Uh, for the current mood, past two months, uh, we are only three months old, by the way. The first board meeting was January 2nd. So I'm just, yesterday I started writing my first quarterly uh, report, uh, which is the quarter January, uh, March. Uh, for the time being, we are in the passive mood. What means the passive mood? We are actually, because people learn about us, they hear about us, they come and say, we would like to come and, and, and sort of establish something in your zone, or we would like to provide some of the services for you. But I can, by next September, we'll go into what I call the active mode. It's not, we will going to see where is our competitive edge with certain industry, and then we will go after these industries. So for example, if we, if we have a competitive edge in automotive industries, we'll go after one of the big automotive industries. I don't know, uh, Tanga already took Renault and Peugeot. That leaves us with Hyundai, Toyota, and Ford. And try to convince them to locate in the zone. Because once one of these big ones locate, all the feeding industry will, will locate, and, and it's going to be uh, uh, flourishing. Of course, uh, it's the chicken and the egg, because uh, when I was in Japan, Toyota said, OK, why don't you attract us by getting the feeding industry there so that we are more encouraged to, uh, to come. But anyway, uh, I would like to divert a little bit from, uh, from Eastern Pursai to give you a little bit uh, background about how the board is thinking. We, we tend to think that at the end of the day, we, are, we also have a developmental uh, role to play in Egypt, not just so our KPIs are not just our financial state. So we will try to attract, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, industries that are actually what you call high density employment. Um, 
I'm going to talk about Sokhna. I'm going to mention high, uh, heavy industry like petrochemicals. Uh, we have already given uh, an oil refinery uh, license. And uh, if you have an oil refinery, you probably have some NAFTA. Uh, there is a big petrochemical project that is currently being, you know, negotiated to be financed by bank. It's likely to be something like six, seven billion US dollars over five years, which is, which is good actually investment to be poured into, into Egypt. But this seven billion dollar plant is likely to employ 150 people. Because it's a, you, you don't want to take any risks in a, in a petrochemical plant. It's fully automated, fully computerized, and so on. Now, uh, compare this 6 billion or 7 billion investment with a 60 to 70 million investment in sports industry, T-shirts and shoes. While, you know, the ratio is 1 to 100, this $60 million is likely to employ 10,000 people. So we'd like to take something like 4 million square meters over here. This is a huge piece of land. It's something like 50 million. So we'll take 4 million and make a sports city. We'll take another 4 million and we're trying to make an electronics city. Why are we trying to attract electronics industry? First of all, the container terminals over here makes, makes, it, makes it very uh, attractive for electronics industry. But electronic industry uh, employs lots of females. Uh, we have an imbalance between male to female unemployment in Egypt. Uh, big time. Uh, of course, because I was in the kitchen, I know I mean, when, when, you, when you hear, for example, that unemployment in Egypt is like 13.5, 13.6, that's the overall. Uh, but actually, we come from a social uh, uh, background where until 1988, the government was promising every university graduate a job. So those who are 55 years or older have zero unemployment. Those who are 30 years or younger have 30% unemployment. Well, so the demographic plays a role. But the important part is, due to the uh, extreme bias on, uh, on labor law to females, you know, she gets her maternity leave, her uh, childcare leave, she travels with her husband and so on. Employers now are more reluctant to hiring females than males. So unemployment among females is like three times or twice, I don't know, uh, uh, males. So and if, if we are able to attract the four million, four uh, million square meters of uh, of, uh, of electronics industry, we will be contributing positively to um, adjusting this imbalance between male and female uh, unemployment. We intend to have another four million of a uh, green zone, where actually the, uh, the zone is actually powered by a solar farm, which will be located in the desert outside of our uh, coordinates, and it's going to be environment friendly, and we are going to, to issue what you call a green certificate for that product. It has its own market in, uh, uh, in you. Uh, the construction of this uh, terminal um, should be done by next January. Uh, the operator will take another year for, to put the cranes and so on. So I would say the port, you know, the second terminal will be operating in January 18. Uh, uh, the tunnels will be three, you know, started last November, the work on the tunnels is three years and a half to four years, so we are also talking three more years over here. We are doing soil enhancement for the first four million square meter over here. So uh, we are in the process of negotiating uh, with different entities, uh, power and water uh, desalination and so on. So whoever is will invest in this zone actually we are trying to synchronize between their plans and our plans in terms of the readiness of, uh, of, 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 of the zone. We are very open, we are very transparent, we are not trying to cheat anyone, we're not, you know, because it's, uh, we, are, we are at the very edge of, you know, we don't want to lose our credibility, you don't want to tell people come, we are ready and, and so on while we are not. But what happened actually is that on, on November 28, 2015, when the president was invited to break grounds for the start of the work in the, uh, in the port and, to, and for the soil enhancement and for the, uh, for the tunnels, it was November 28, I remember the date very well. It was portrayed as if it is 
the start of the project, not the start of the construction. So, and, and, and this wrong PRing is not only in the minds of the Egyptians, you know, set, let aside the fact that I'm met in the street and people, you know, are asking me when are the uh, advertisement for jobs are coming to come. But it was also portrayed for foreigners. You know, I spent, uh, you know, December and January, I couldn't hold my breath from meeting with foreigners who would like to come and, you know, and, uh, and, and locate in Eastern Pursaid. And a couple of them, you know, were not, we did not have ideas. One of them came into my office. He has actually the architectural drawings of the factory. And said, I would like to build this factory in Eastern Pursaid. So managing expectations is something that we are trying to do for, uh, for Eastern Pursaid. But it is a rising star by all means. And everybody knows that they would like they would like to be there. It has a positive uh, uh, it has a positive uh, I would say uh, uh, perception. Uh, you know, even w we have what you call industrial developers. Industrial developers are a de is a developer who is not coming to build a factory. He comes and says, "I would like to have four million square meters of land. Just give me electricity and water on the tip of my land. I will prepare the infrastructure." and I will invite the business to come and locate, I'm selling the service for them. So uh, when, when we ask them, tell us a little bit more about your customers and who you'd like to locate and so on, and once they mention heavy industry, I say no, but heavy industry is going to be in Sokhna, the land is more rocky, and this is where you could. You know what, what we got? I said okay, he took the pen and said okay, there's no problem, I give up on heavy industry, I want Eastern Pursite. So Eastern Persaid is, is perceived uh, very positively. We just hope that we, uh, we continue on that and we keep our promises and our uh, credibility. Uh, these are all uh, more detailed. Than, uh, this is the second example I'd like to stop at, which is uh, West Kantara. West Kantara is, is a totally different flavor. It's close to Delta. Uh, so uh, we tend to think it's going to be agribusiness and food and packaging and uh, and, and lots of that. Um, we have requests for technology parks in Western, uh, in Western Kantara. It's close to three universities, Mansoura, Zazi, and, and, uh, and Kanal University in Ismailia. We have a request for uh, an Olympic park. Um, Olympic parks now are not only for tournaments. Apparently, they are used year-round for training and, and, and events and so on. So uh, this is another, uh, this is another um, zone that has a totally different uh, flavor. Um, we have a little bit of, uh, of a height restriction in West Kantara due to some of the uh, surrounding operations, but uh, still for the kind of industry that is targeted uh, should not cause uh, a problem. Uh, this is my third example that uh, uh, I, I selected for you, which is Sokhna. And one more time you see that the Sokhna port became an integrated part. This is this blue part over here is the 20 square kilometer, uh, which was like version zero or version one of the, of the Suez Canal zone. Uh, you would like, to, that was established in 2003. It was, it was not connected to the Sokhna port. There were lots of bureaucracies there. And between 2003, 2015, out of those uh, 20 kilometers, they were able only to develop and market and sell eight kilometers out of the 20 or that. Uh, thanks God, actually, we, we were able to market uh, six more and uh, another six are coming uh, during King Salman uh, visit. The dark zone is the heavy industry zone. Uh, and this is where we're going to, we have steel factories, we have oil refineries, we have petrochemicals and so on. Uh, uh, petrochemical is actually somewhere over here. Uh, the northern you go, it's medium to light industry. This zone over here, because it's very close to the touristic area in Sokhna, is designated to be a commercial, uh, a commercial zone. The wind, by the way, is blowing in that direction. So we're very environmental alert. We are not actually interfering with any of the uh, uh, touristic uh, zone. We have lots of opportunities, actually, in, in Sokhna. We have lots of opportunities in, in, in ports. Uh, I, 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 I always try to, on purpose, uh, show the, uh, the map of Sokhna port because there is an illusion that Dubai ports have a concession on Sokhna port. 
Uh, Dubai ports have a concession on one basin. The port is three basins. So we have two more basins to develop in Sofna port. And there's nothing in the agreements with Dubai ports that will allow, does not allow us to do that. It all depends on the uh, business and fi model that, and the cash flow analysis that, uh, uh, that we do. Uh, any, someone, any, any person who is locating anywhere will put us among the chart, and we are ready to be put among the charts. You know, uh, uh, whether it's about location, where are we located, and how are we connected with the in, inland and out of land, the basic infrastructure, uh, the ease of doing business, the incentives, we are ready for that. For the basic infrastructure, spe especially in Eastern Perseid, I'm pursuing actually futuristic infrastructure. I'm looking now at, uh, at three different companies, one in Singapore, one in Netherlands, and one in France. I would like to have, you know, what you call a smart industrial zone. There is a, a big initiative that has been going for years now towards smart cities. We're going to have a smart industrial zone. I'm asking them to have, you know, one of those science fiction uh, infrastructure in the zone. You have a control room where you can control everything when an emergency happens. It's very simple. If we're talking about 70 square kilometers in Eastern Perseid, uh, Jabal Ali took them, it took them uh, 15 years to fill 20 square kilometers. So those 70 kilometers are not going to be filled in 2020. They are not going to be filled in 2025. Let's be realistic. We'll be very clever if we can fill them in 2035, which is this phase one, and then phase two starts after 2035. They will give us more land, I hope, if, uh, if, it is, uh, if the zone is, is successful. So somebody will decide to locate his business in 2030 in that zone. He should find the latest, the most flexible infrastructure to sit upon. So this we are, uh, um, you know, thankfully when I go anywhere, um, they distribute my uh, sort of my profile and, and, and biography. So uh, uh, they usually don't ask me about this because they know I founded e-government and I'm challenging them on thing. And, uh, uh, I was actually, um, you're aware that the, uh, King Salman is visiting, uh, is visiting Egypt uh, soon. Uh, I was uh, sitting with Sheikh Saleh Kamal a uh, few days ago, and he said we'd like to announce something to be done uh, in the zone. I said I don't want to announce something will be done in the zone. I'd like you to send your lawyer, get him to register, and establish your company, and let's announce that the company was established. And he looked at me and I said, just send him. I'm challenging. Try me. Ah, try me. <laughs> and, and this is actually, uh, and this is, I don't want you to, to take my word on it. Just go and try it yourself. Try to register your company in, 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 in our zone and see how long it will take you. Uh, someone was impressed. He registered. He got the license. And he got the piece of land in three days. We, our engineer goes with him with the GPS and he gets, and he gets the land. Why we are doing that? It's not that, uh, you know, uh, we are trying to, uh, to tease the Egyptian government, but we are lucky. Because those 461 square kilometers were pre-cleared. You know, when you get a piece of land in Egypt, the first thing they tell you, okay, you have to go to the archaeological department to make sure that this is not an archaeological site. And then you have to go, if it is close to the sea, you have to go to the authority of the lakes to make sure that it's not very close to the sea. And then if you are in the desert, you'll have to go to the military to make sure that it's not a military operation site and so on. The nice thing they have done to us is that those 461 square kilometers are pre-cleared. So when we award a piece of land, we just give it to the investor. We don't have to go anywhere because they have already gotten the approval of all these, uh, 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 you know, of all these entities in 2015 before they give us uh, the land. So. We have some advantages, and uh, we tend to think that, you know, what we would like to do as a board um, the first three years is to lay the foundation. And this foundation is, is to us two things. We'd like to lay the best infrastructure, and we'd like to have the uh, correct legal and regulatory framework. This is very important um, to have, you know, uh, the, uh, the right contract for a user fract for a piece of land, uh, I'm asking investors, you see, um, you know, the first uh, power and, and water desalination plant I've done in Sokhna, it's an EPC plus finance. I don't want to overburden, actually, the, uh, uh, the, the zone with, with more loans. So in Eastern Persaid, I'm opening the door for, actually, 
uh, for investors to come. We are probably, you probably guess that we were approached by, you know, once the master plan was out, we were approached by every company in the world that does power generation and water desalination, they came to us. And I say, look, if I have the money, I will transparently uh, tender it out. But if you come to me and say, Ahmed, we'd like a piece of land and a license to sell electricity or a license to sell water, I'll give you a piece of land and a license to sell water. I will make sure that the service level agreement with my partner, which is the customer on the, on the land, is good. I want to make sure how, uh, how much the prices are affected by, uh, by the prices of oil, how much the prices are affected by inflation, and so on. But I was actually very comfortable sitting on the chair saying, yes, just give me, but I don't have actually this license written. I really need all the legal help that is needed. I'm negotiating with Port of Singapore for the uh, second, uh, for the uh, container terminal. We will be discussing, will they come as an operator or we're going to establish a joint company and, and go together and so on. And I'm very comfortable sitting with them, but I really don't have this legal, uh, this legal uh, thing. And we are, we are, we are looking in, 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 into that. Uh, the person who's leading this committee looking uh, for, the, for this uh, legal help is Dr. Khaled Sarisyam. So uh, uh, I hope we get. And, um, and uh, I learned a lot about uh, legal offices that they specialize in things. So we, you don't get uh, a legal office to do everything. There are those who are in ports, those who are in, in power, and those who are in land, and so on and, and, and so forth. But to make a long story short, we are ready to stand against competition. Uh, our best uh, bet actually is a, on a, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. When we sit with the investor, we give him the advice, we treat him as our partner, say where he should be located, what's going to happen, and this is our incentive packages and so on, and this is where we, uh, we hope we'll be doing uh, well. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to give you a quick, very fast introduction about uh, uh, a huge project that will last for uh, probably two to three decades until it gets uh, fully, uh, fully developed. Nabil, I don't know how to thank you for giving me this opportunity to address those people. Thank, thank you. you. <coughs> I'll open it up to questions. What I suggest is you take two or three questions together and then answer them as, as you want. Uh, this looks very interesting. But let me be the devil's advocate for us. Everybody following the world economy seems to conclude that it's actually the growth rate is decreasing <laughs> rather than increasing. Of course. <laughs> How do you expect to finance this and make a profit from it? And given our priorities today in Egypt, where liquidity is very, very tight, when is this going to break even? This is my first point. My second point, frankly, is I know you said this is not only a financial issue. It has a social content, specifically the employment issue. But what's the projection for cost versus profit for the, for the project? Any other questions at the same time? This is one question, not five. Andy, go ahead. Uh, yeah. 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 So, thank you for the presentation. Uh, this is a, a truly impressive uh, project. My question, however, has to do with the, you know, the developmental impact of, uh, of the project. Specifically, how does it fit in the development plan of Egypt? And I must say that uh, if one thinks about it in this way, there is more reasons to be concerned about the impact of this project other than to celebrate. So zones like this are enclave economies. Uh, you know, developmental impact is how much you spread it and how much you distribute it. Uh, and it seems to me that everything in this uh, project is actually designed to not spread it. But at the same time, in terms of distribution, you're going to bring workers uh, to bargain at very bad conditions. And ultimately, they will get, uh, 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 you will have a check actually a huge zone of split shots. So the question then is, how is it that we're going to get out from this uh, idea of development through zones uh, that actually benefit very few? Uh, 
uh, and so even when we talk, you, you mentioned the idea that it's going to hire more women. It seems to me that the only way that will happen is to actually take away maternity leaves and take away all those impediments that actually makes you know labor laws more expensive. Um, and so that would be my 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 question, and I'm also being the devil's advocate in that sense. I see. Well, I would like very much to to thank you. Me, not you myself. Thank Dr. Ahmed Darwish for this wonderful presentation. And I would like to ask him, you know, I heard about the, uh, the, the electronic city, but, you know, I was thinking more of a knowledge city and also about the potential uh, 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 work for our graduates in the media. So, you know, I'm thinking also a media city in addition to the knowledge city close to the electronic city. This is in the plan. Thank you. Why don't we allow Dr. Darwish to answer these questions, and then we'll go on to some more. OK. <clears throat> of course, work finance is not doing very well. Uh, I think it will be the first year since a long time that China is going to do a single digit. Unheard of. China was among the countries that I think, or everybody thinks, that they were cheating on their uh, growth. When they do 13, they announce 11 or something like that. They are going to do 6 or 7. You know, Chinese, if they wake up in the morning and have breakfast, this is enough, actually, GDP <laughs> to make more than 6 or 7 percent. So it's a tough year. Um, expectations on international trade growth is 0 0.3 percent, which is between 0 0.3 to 0 0.7, which means that any terminal, any port terminal you are creating, for it to operate means you are biting from the market share of someone else. You are not just taking what is being uh, created. But I, you know, I tend to think that those are the years where you start actually these kinds of projects. So that when, because the, econ the world economy will go in, in sine wave. We, we all know that. And it's going down, it will go up. Definitely will go up. And we'd like to be ready when it goes, when it goes up. So this is actually the time where we are trying to to do that, and this is the time where we are trying to achieve partnership, and this is the time where we are trying to be, re you know, for example, if we can get this petrochemical deal to go through, okay, this, you know, to have a full petrochemical plant is like a five years, but like in two years, I will have a couple of more products. If the economy is better in two years, those products from the petrochemical plant are a huge input to lots of other industries that I'm going to have in Sokhna in terms of garment, you know, in terms, you know, lots of things that could be based on the outcome of this petrochemical plant. So this is the right time actually to go and negotiate a petrochemical plant so that when the economy is up, you know, all those factories will, uh, uh, will, will come. Uh, we tend to think that we will, at a certain point in time, we will have you know, some appetite, you know, there are, there is lots of appetite coming actually in, in terms of, because this is where the money is, they you'd say, we'll come and, and help you with your infrastructure. Uh, I'm still challenging them if they can find this, you know, investor uh, formula. They asked me BOT, and I said, I don't need the T, it's BO. I'm, I would like to maintain this, you know, economic zone, the authority, I'd like to maintain it as slim as possible. It's not my core business, actually, to run a power plant. It's not my core business to run a water desalination plant. So, I, in fact, even the EPC plus finance one that I signed in Sokhna three weeks ago, I signed it with 25 years of o &M. I'm not ready, actually, to hire engineers. I'm not ready to hire technicians. You build it well, you operate it. And I actually have enough... Uh, uh, sort of, uh, 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 I would say, uh, measuring points. So, for example, you know, uh, if the gas consumption of the of the power plant it goes beyond a certain level, they pay the extra gas because it means they are not maintaining the power plant well, such that it is consuming more gas to produce the same for 457 megawatts. So. Uh, some of the, uh, of the sovereign funds, you know, I think will have an appetite for, for infrastructure. Infrastructure will not be done through normal investors. 
because it's a little bit of a, of a long-term investment. The break-even point is a little bit further. The ROI and RRI are, are not uh, that. But I'm, I'm optimistic of that. The cost versus profit. No, we are very profitable. You know, I, um, uh, we have six ports. You know, operating six ports is not, you know, should be an extremely profitable, uh, profitable operation. And uh, I will combine this question actually with the next one in terms of uh, uh, somebody asked about, you know, how would that integrate with, uh, with uh, was it Hani? You asked about how would that integrate with, with, with Egypt. One of my six ports is making a profit of 19 million Egyptian pounds, which is like $2 million. And when I met with them, I said, guys, you know, um, I come from a consulting background and I used to consult on governance. And what you are running is actually what we, what we used to call a family business. They looked at me and said, yes, you know, a family business is something where the grandfather or the father built to make sure that his kids will have, you know, will have good living. So the state gave you this port and you are running it actually for the benefit of your families. You're not giving the state anything back because, you know, to get $2 million out of a port is a ridiculous amount of money. So the first thing I've done actually is that I visited the Minister of uh, Transportation in his office and I said, Mr. Minister, I have six ports out of 15 in Egypt. Of course, I'm not one third because Alexandria is a very heavy weight, but it's still six out of 15 is, is, is something. I would like to know what's the national plan of ports in Egypt because I would like to fit into the national plan of ports. And don't worry, I would, I would be able to make money even though I'm fitting in the national plan because the way you run a port is make, makes things different. So, no, we are running things on a profitable basis. We don't intend to, to subsidize utilities in there, but we're still going to make money. We, in fact, uh, we, we will be ready to sell utilities in, we are a free zone, we'll be ready to sell utilities in US dollars. You know, I mean, this, this, uh, this integrated water power plant I signed is a $500 million, okay? I'm not ready actually to collect my utilities in Egyptian pounds and then stand in line at the CBE and say, okay, I need to pay this loan, so I, I'm giving you Egyptian pounds, give me US dollars. I'm going to sell utilities in US dollars. And this actually will make people who are locating into my zone think twice. Because one of our vision is that we are 80% export oriented, 20% local market oriented. So if he's not 80% export oriented, you know, and if he's local market oriented, and most of his income is going to be in Egyptian pounds, you know, then maybe this is a way actually to get people to rethink about the nature and the character and the style and the flavor of who should be locating in, uh, uh, in, 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 in the zone. Uh, how is this going to spread to Egypt? I mean, um, unfortunately it's being taped and under my microphone, but let me try to put that in a very uh, nice way. And uh, Mona will understand what I mean word by word. Despite all this flexibility and decision making we're making and all that, I tell you something. We are binded by the Egyptian law. So I am actually registering companies by law number 159. And I'm giving actually, and my environmental assessment is based on the environmental law of Egypt. And those building licenses that I'm giving in 10 days are based on the Egyptian law. So what we are trying to prove actually is that if you have a better interpretation, a modern interpretation of the Egyptian law, and you start with the right work cycle and the right things, you could be efficient. It's not in the law. Yeah, I, I totally understand that some articles in these laws, they need changes. But most of the bureaucracy you see is about layers and layers of actually ministerial decrees and so on that were put on the top of that and it needs someone to say, throw away this, let's start with a fresh white piece of paper and we can, we can do it in a different way. So the way this could be spread in Egypt is that if you ask me, it's not because I'm selfish or anything, I would like to see this to be the last special economic zone, the first and the last special economic zone in Egypt. Because the whole of Egypt could be a special economic zone if they come and map our procedures. 
It's as simple as that. And this is how things could be done in Egypt, because we prove to them that we can do it. It's not something hard. It's doable. It's not, I'm not talking about something that we intend to do. I'm doing it something that is already done. Well, actually, in, the only thing that is actually between us and registering your company over internet is that there is something in the law that says if the contract is over 5,000, you know, a lawyer had to witness it, and we really need to go and, and sign a deal with the, uh, with the syndicate to give them, you know, uh, uh, electronic signature so that they can, so that lawyers could sign electronic. But we are ready tomorrow, actually, that they file uh, over internet. We're doing all that in a very easy way. So it will spread in Egypt. I think it will spread in Egypt because someone at a certain point in time will ask why I'm standing in Sokhna and doing it in one day and I'm standing elsewhere, I'm doing it in three weeks. Someone will ask this question at a certain time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, our KPIs is about the contribution to the GDP and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the employment. We've never mentioned the fact that we are trying to take away benefits from, from the employees. But uh, my experience is, and, and this is what I keep saying, of course I have a conflict of interest because I'm an Egyptian, but I keep saying this all over the world. Egyptians are very intelligent, they are very smart, they are trainable, and believe it or not, which is very most important, they are disciplined if they don't work for the government. You can discipline if they don't work in the government. So, uh, so, and I'll give you this very simple example. Chinese were actually kind of uh, not very comfortable at our labor law because it has a maximum of 10% foreign employments in, in, uh, in your business. If you would like to break the 10%, you have to come and apply, specifically say, I would like to hire more than 10% because I have the following, I did not find the following expertise and so on, and you justify, and then you get a special weaver. The special weaver is given by the Minister of Labor, which is in our case, the Board of Directors, because we became the Minister of Labor. When they came to us and says, we'd like to have a weaver of this 10% in order to locate in the zone, and they, they don't have actually a little business, Chinese have 7.23 square kilometers, Huh? 7,200,000 square meters. So it's a lot. And they are inviting business. They have a, a fiber uh, glass plant. And they are inviting China glass. China glass is the largest glass manufacturing in the world. It's going to locate in Sokhna. So you really want this business on your land. So, and we decided, no, we're not going to give you a pre-approval. You come to us and one by one case by case basis, you justify, you say, I advertised, I did not find this expertise and this skill in Egypt. So this is why I would like to go beyond the 10% that's in the law. And you tell us what is your plan in order, with the years, you bring it down to 10%. So finally, actually, they agreed. They built a fiber glass. I visited this one three weeks ago. It's a good, it's a good manufacturing plan. It's doing very well. And then I asked. What's the ratio of foreign employment in that plan? And it's 94% Egyptians. So it's not even at the 10%. They did not need to go to the 10%. It's 6% Chinese, 94% Egyptians. So uh, I don't think, you know, our employment laws and, and so on and the like are going to be an extreme hurdle. In the case of electronics, they will be forced because they want females. So they will live with, the, with, the, with those protection that we have in the law because they need the females. This is why we mentioned uh, electronics. Males don't have this kind of patience to deal with the electronics, uh, with the electronics uh, industry. I did not talk about everything in my presentation. Um, we have, uh, they have an initiative called the Research Triangle. Dr. Mohsen Mahdi came to us with it and he's actually the anchor in Egypt. Uh, where they would like to uh, sort of connect between a university and, uh, and development entity and industry and so on. And they will choose the Suez Canal Zone to be the location for this uh, uh, research triangle. The Knowledge City 
I'm not aware what those this technology park that they would that they are creating uh, uh, in West Kantara, they have applied. They don't like the fact that uh, our land is uh, is used for intifa. <coughs> they would like to own the land. Said we don't. So we're still negotiating on the fact that they can take it on a use of fracked basis to do their uh, technology park. Uh, with industries and with logistics, we found no problem with the use of fracked. It's with the housing and some of the, uh, and the commercial and some of little things that they don't like use of fracked. But industries and logistics, they are quite, uh, you know, and the ports, all of them are at use of fracked basis all over the world, so they don't, this, they don't, uh, they don't mind. Uh, but we are open also to have a university somewhere, and uh, we have lots of land, and we are, we are open. But we, don't, we are not going to award lots of universities' land, so we are very cautious. We got, uh, I guess, one or two requests we did not like very much, so we, we, we did not uh, give a positive uh, reply. But because we want, when we award you know, a university or a research center or something, it becomes really, uh, uh, really something. But back to this, uh, my final comment regarding this uh, human resources and employee. Part of our incentive package is that we are giving this guarantee to whoever is going to locate his business in our zone. Come and locate your business in our zone. Advertise for the employment you need. If you don't find those with the right skills and experience that you need, we, the Suez Canal Economic Zone, are going to train them at our own expense up to your own satisfaction. And we are open, we know very well that the big multinationals, they have their own training centers. And we don't mind that. Because if you want to train them in your own training center, because you have very special skills and this training center is adapted, we will pay the bill of your training center. Because at the end of the day, I'm creating an employment opportunity, which is currently in government, the last time it was computed, you know, 2010 when I was in, office, it was like 44,000 or 48,000 pounds to create a, 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 a job in government. So no matter how much I'm paying actually to get that, and this is what you call a directed training. I'm not government. I'm not doing a training where I'm training youth and injecting them in the market. The hit rate on that is between 30 to 40 percent. I have all the statistics. I was in the kitchen for seven years. But this is directed training. The hit rate is 90 to 95 percent. At most, someone will resign and the other one will be fired. But, you know, if he's asking me for 10 or 20 people, likely nine of them are going to, to, stay, on, uh, to stay on job. So. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Amal and uh, Rahim and, and Hamid. Yeah. Um, I, I have two questions. So, with here, it's, <coughs> since you're autonomous, what's the relationship you have specifically with, with the Ministry of Investment that has um, also priorities for FDI? And how do you align that? Uh, in the interest of the priorities of the country? That's my first question. Second is just a very specific one. When you sit in one-on-one -on -one meetings, how do you differentiate yourself competitively versus Jabal Ali specifically? What's your competitive advantage over Jabal Ali? Ibrahim? <laughs> 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 Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, for this extremely interesting and useful presentation. Uh, I think this sounds like a project for modern economy, which is extremely uh, required. I will put uh, Hans question differently. I think you have answered most of my questions. You said that the zone is bound to, uh, to, to spread to Egypt. I think it would be useful to identify how it will spread to the Egyptian economy. And not only through modernizing the laws, but how economic activities will link up. And I think this will be extremely useful because we have a very backward economy, a very underdeveloped economy that needs to be modernized. So I think this is one. Second, you are partly in Sinai. How could this link up to the development of Sinai? This could also be very useful. It could be like a tractor for modernizing both the Egyptian economy and for the development of the society. Then uh, you have uh, written down here about volumes of employment, skills, and training, and, 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 and I think that 
in measuring competitiveness and competitive pressure, employment should be taken into account. And mixing up capital intensive industries and labor intensive industries is a very good way to go, and I think you did very well in that. But I think that the international market for goods and services could, could, be, could be studied so as to see how there is demand, but also how it uh, could generate, uh, generate uh, employment. Um, I have my concern also with Hany with regard to labor laws. Because special economic zones are known, are known to ignore labor laws. Of course, I come from background. This is why I raised uh, it. And this is extremely important because you do not want to uh, increase employment only. It's about conditions of employment. Uh, and this, in fact, is what would modernize the economy because you don't want to need conditions of labor or of underdevelopment. And finally, a question which links up to the viewers. <coughs> to whom is the board the counter? I mean, it looks like uh, it can do everything on its own. So to whom is it the counter? I'm an, an, an I'm no, most of my questions are already being asked, but well, we'll go to Mona. Uh, <laughs> one thing that is about expansion, and given that is the current uh, trade volume is declining, and uh, this region in particular is emphasizing on oil, and the oil is going to be you know, going to be low for quite a couple of decades. Uh, do you want to incorporate in that is given that you want to expand? Is it better to be on the strategy of consolidating some ports and these the others for the future growth rather than going around? Okay, Mona, and then we'll uh, stop and then we'll come back. Take Anna, and and I you. want to say that what I heard today is like music to my ears. I was uh, sitting uh, in 2002 reviewing all the, the competition laws in uh, Singapore, in Turkey, in Philippines, in Jebel Ali, in wherever, I mean, you name it, and trying to create a concept that would be, that would have a competitive edge as compared to all of those, and would still fit with the Egyptian condition. This was my dilemma when I was working on, the, on this uh, draft, and uh, there was no committee. I got it by an assignment from a ministerial committee that was at that time chaired by the Minister of House, don't tell me why. Because they own the land. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, so I, I, that was the, the real uh, challenge. And so how to create a legal framework that would be empowering to uh, an authority that could really be an island of efficiency, of excellence, and that would uh, uh, have the benefits of uh, uh, still apply the law, but would, would, would have the benefits of not being bound by the bureaucracy and by all the, the, the negative effects of our uh, policies and our uh, management or uh, uh, lack of management of proper management and so on. And, what I heard today is, uh, yes, I mean, at that time, the idea was not to create a special economic zone in uh, somewhere in Sokhna, that was the only one available at that time, and then create one in Aswan and Luxor and Sinai and uh, the North uh, Coast. Well, the idea was, or the dream was, if we manage to have one that proves to the government, the people, the businessmen, the investors, the financial institutions, the international, that it can be done in Egypt, if we have the proper framework, then it will just, it will uh, pass on and happen elsewhere, and the original economy will be contaminated with good policies, good practices, good examples, good models, and so on, and nobody will be afraid of change, because this has been the challenge. Wherever, whenever we in Egypt propose um, a, a substantial change, there is a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance, and we have setbacks. So this would be the model. That was the dream, the model that would prove that it can be done. 
So this is actually what Dr. Tanish is saying. He's saying, I'm not dreaming of having a hundred special economic zone. I'm dreaming of showing, having the showcase, particularly, not just to the whole world, but particularly to the Egyptians and the Egyptian bureaucracy to show them what they can do. And so this is my first point to tell you how happy and how grateful I am. The, the second uh, point is I am interested in something that uh, Amal also raised, uh, which is uh, the incentive package. Because whenever we go, whenever, when we are comparing between all of those economic zones, we always look at the incentive tax. And every single one of them said the tax is not high on the priority list. But it is still there. No, it is, a, it is an extreme. Huh? I will tell you, it's an extreme burden. Okay, so when we compare, we found that it ranges from zero tax, because it's a free zone, to 15% tax, which was the highest at that time when I made the comparison at Shenzhen. And so we chose the highest. Because we couldn't no, it was 10%. Uh, no, you, you, the law you had was 10%. The law I, was changed to 22% last June, and I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, so but there was something 10% wage tax we lowered or we applied. You know, corporate I mean, tax we gave certain benefits that were not at the zero, no exemption. Yeah. Yeah. But we gave lower, uh, ta reasonable, lower, attractive uh, for wages, for. Uh, uh, even for uh, cost for yeah. rates and for uh, the corporate, corporate tax, tax, a lower tax rate. It, it's not the most mm. important, but it still counts at a much lower. Uh, the, the most important thing, and I think it, which uh, has been raised, is that we put a complete uh, employment uh, regime. And I'd like you to please speak about that, because I like to claim that it was fair and balanced and that it did not give away the rights of the Egyptian employees. Yeah. But it facilitated yeah. the, the whole process and made it less complicated and uh, uh, easy and fair. So I'd like you to please talk about this. The, the last thing is, I, uh, would you please make a comparison between now as we stand, the incentive package and the rest of, uh, we and the rest of the, at least, the, the competition, the rest of the world that you showed us on your map that we claim to be hopefully competing with them and beating them uh, soon. Thank you. Okay, we don't have too much time, so I'm going to take Haney's question, and then uh, Dr. Darwish can merge the answers into okay. each other. Uh, well, thank you very much. Excellent presentation, and it's quite uh, a, uh, an intriguing project. Um, uh, you know, I must preface this by saying that I'm a bit more skeptical today about economic zones and special economic zones than I would have been 10, 20, 30 years ago. I'm just wondering whether you are coming into a, a stage of change in, in a stage of change in the global economy uh, that is uh, changing the way we trade, change the way we manufacture, change the way we, uh, we uh, move labor uh, around, and technology is playing a very important role of it, uh, in the process. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what is your uh, business model? What's, where is, uh, if, if, if you have to do a balance, what's your assets and what's your liabilities? And it looks to me like your main asset is the land that the government has granted and now you're, uh, you know, and ports. Uh, allotting it out. Land and ports. So, so, lands and ports. So it's basically assets that the government has given to you, and I'm just wondering how much of that is the government getting back and in what form it is getting back. Uh, if you look at the current uh, models that have been talked about by Kumana and others, uh, You've got Hong Kong, uh, I think Shenzhen was mentioned, and I know a lot about Shenzhen, um, having been involved in China for, uh, very extensively. Uh, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, uh, Singapore uh, are quite different than Jabal Ali in the sense that they are fully integrated into the global, into the, the national economy. Uh, they basically are an integral part of the economy. Shenzhen, of course, was the firm that China started in the 1980s. Uh, it opened to the world, and then it became an integral part of the economy. 
so to the extent that they are, uh, you know, charging some value like um, taxes, corporate taxes, and whatever, it is because it's very much integrated into the local economy. Jabal Ali is a sort of standalone project. It doesn't really integrate very fully into the uh, Dubai or, or the UAE economy, but it integrates very well into the concept of Dubai itself. Uh, Dubai is an economy that's based on one very simple principle. It's called real estate. It's how real estate is allocated and how it's sold and whatever. And I'm just wondering whether if you're doing something like that, that is not fully integrated into the Egyptian economy as Shenzhen is, or as Hong Kong is, or Singapore is. Uh, is. Is there an alternative model like Dubai that you could do to which the Egyptian government will get back uh, multiples of its uh, initial investment in, in sending off? To the region. I will try, and uh, we've already three minutes beyond our time, and I have 11 questions and or slash comments, but I will start actually uh, with, 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 with the comment that Mona made. We are, we are doing things differently. Uh, unfortunately, Mona, when phase one was created in 2003, and it said you could have your own commercial registry or not Egypt, you know what they have done? They invited someone who's 59 years old from the commercial registry of Egypt, and they said, wow, this is a real uh, uh, person who's real, have good experience, and he probably imported everything. I went in last December, and I said, I, kept, I hope you're proud of me, because I challenged lots of what you are doing, and I'm an engineer, and believe it or not, I came out to be correct versus all what they have doing. And uh, common sense, I said, you know, they were actually requiring them to have uh, an address inside the zone. I said, we are 159. Does anything in 159 says that uh, the address is in the zone? You know, so I started actually allowing companies that are registered in Egypt just to notify me. I'm the following company and I'm going to do business. I started actually to allow people to register companies even if they are not going to get a piece of land because they could, they could be doing services. So it's all about how to do things in a different, in a different, uh, in a different way, and then I'll get the the, the questions. Uh, uh, you know, how are we aligned with the Ministry of Investment? Uh, we are to the Ministry of Investment uh, just one opportunity among other opportunities in Egypt. So they, you know, they uh, point to our website when they are having road shows. They ask us to do uh, things uh, together. I don't want actually to talk about the Ministry of Finance in a bad way because I'm being taped, you know. But uh, last time I was in Japan, I had my PowerPoints in Japanese, and the representative of the of Gafi was speaking in Arabic, and his PowerPoints were in Arabic. So I mean, I'd rather do better. I would do better without them, actually. If this is how they are helping me. Thank you. I don't need their help. Uh, this is, you know. Uh, What's our competitive edge versus Jabal Ali? In fact, this is what we are, you know, this is our second, uh, uh, you know, drill on the master plan. Because the first master plan was awarded to Daryl Handasa. Daryl Handasa is a more of an urban planning uh, designer. So they have actually invited some partners in when, when they came to the economy and commercial uh, and the commercial part of it. So, you know, when they decide that in Eastern Persaid, you know, we'd like to attract automotive and pharmaceutical, you know, but, you know, I'm sitting with Toyota or with Hyundai. Why would they locate their next business? I don't know. Uh, my, my plan and policy with Jabal Ali, which, you know, we, we started to have relations with Dubai Ports and Jabal Ali, is not going to be that we are competing with them. I think we're going to be integrating with them. Because what we can do in the zone, they cannot do over there. And some of the things they are doing over there, we cannot. Jabal Ali is more around the uh, logistics. They don't have any of the industry. So we have like, you know, we have the transshipment at the port, we have the logistics, and then we have this extra tier of industry. So there are lots of things that we can do together in a good way. You know, if we're talking about leagues one more time, we can pass the ball to each, uh, to each other some, uh, somehow. Uh, do we partly, uh, we are partly in Sinai, do we contribute in Sinai? We contribute in Sinai for as much as we exist in Sinai. But Sinai has like two big projects that will go on. One in, in, in southern of Sinai that they are trying to, uh, to, uh, to, to, wor to work on. And in fact, uh, when we were trying to get uh, some of the uh, development uh, money that is given by foreign, they said, but this is all for, uh, for Sinai. So I'm, I'm aware that... Uh, there is a big project for the southern of, the, of Sinai. I don't know the details of which. 
We are never ignoring the labor law. Uh, in fact, I was on the phone yesterday, just yesterday night actually, with uh, Ambassador Yasser Hassan, who's actually now uh, advising the chairman of, uh, you call him the director of, uh, of, the director general of ILO, director general of ILO, in terms of how we, how can we create in the zone what you call a favorable, a favorable working environment, and we can make that as a good example. So we will try to market this. Uh, we are accountable to the president and to the parliament. You were accountable to the parliament. I just, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the economic committee of the parliament, they just gave me heads up that once they will be done with the, uh, with the government uh, uh, and the budget, they will call upon me because they would like to know what's going on in the zone and how we are. Uh, it, w we need to consolidate some of the ports. Uh, yes, in fact, what, are, what some of the studies we're doing right now, do we develop, you know, the second basin in, in Sokhna or we don't? The, what's the right time to do that? Because we, you know, this, you know, I'm a very scientific person and this is what I used to do as a consultant. I wish I could still be that. I could have done it to the zone. I, I'd like to see the cash flow and I'd like to see if this is, because l let me give you numbers. Dubai ports, when they got their concessions, they promised us 1.1 million containers in three years. It's now over 10 years and they haven't gone ever beyond 550,000, which is like half. Is this because, you know, uh, Dubai does not have an interest to grow this beyond what is going because, you know, most of the traffic is going over there, or this is true. If I develop the second basin, will I be shooting myself in the foot? I'm not making money then. Or there is actually more, 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 more to do. The same thing in Eastern Pursaid. If I do a third container terminal for the Chinese, you know, because I have one for Mersic and I have one for, Port Let, if I say I, I do a third one for Costco, would, would that attract business or not? I, we really need to do that in a, a scientific, uh, in a scientific way. So we are not actually, uh, running after doing things. The incentive packages and the taxes. This is truly something um, I'm more comfortable over here to talk really more frequently. You know, there are three questions that have been asked all over the world. One of them is about security and safety of the, of the region. And I always say that we are enjoying the safe haven of the Suez Canal. Have you ever heard about any single incident knock on the wood since 2011, the Suez Canal? Never. So I say, okay, I'm the banks of the Suez Canal. And they keep asking about Libya and Syria. Libya is 1,000 kilometers away. Syria is two countries away. But you say that they still have their own concerns. The second concern was about foreign currency, which does not apply at all because we are a free zone. You know, you, he will not stand in line in the first place. At it. But the third question, which is, you know, I've been asked that all over the world from all over, Thomas. We heard you have a 22.5% corporate tax. Is this true or this is a joke? Some of them was as blunt as that. It was 10% until last June. And last June, when they were changing the law to do a few good things, you know, the Minister of Finance, you know, just came in and said, I'd like to make this 22% like the rest of Egypt. Well, okay, he's not the Minister of Finance anymore, so I should defend him. So, I mean, when he was a Minister of Finance, I was not. So I tell you what, he, what, what his argument was. He had two arguments. One of them is a correct argument, and the other one is a totally wrong argument. The, first, the correct argument was, he said, I'm afraid that, guys, forget about development in Upper Egypt, forget about development elsewhere. If you have a place in Egypt where the, ta where the corporate tax is 10%, for the next 10 years, everybody building a factory will be building it over there. He will not build anywhere else. So he was afraid about the uneven development that Hany uh, was, was, was talking about. The second, which is something that we have to look at. The second argument, which was totally wrong, he said, I have 82 uh, uh, non-double tax treaty agreements with 82 countries. I'm not richer than the United States. They pay over there 28%. Why they pay 10% over here and they pay 18% over there? I get the money. What he did not take into consideration is that all companies actually, they locate wherever there is no tax. Apple is not registered in the United States. Apple is registered in Ireland. So this Henny totally got wrong. But I'm not willing actually to go to the president nor go to the parliament with a narrative text versus a narrative text argument. So what we are trying to do actually is that we're trying to prepare a tax study now that tells me, and with a tax simulator, at 10%, how much money Egypt will be making. Because this, is, this money that goes directly to Egypt does not go to the zone. What the money I make actually, according to my law, I can reinvest in the zone. I don't have to give to, to, the, to the state. So at 10%, how much money is making at 15 and so on. The last time within this simulator, for example, during the, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the, the famous tax law was that at 26%, if you go higher than 26%, what you will be collecting is less, not more. So it's not necessary that the more you tax you make, that means the, the more you are, you are collecting. So we are looking at that. And, and some of the good, uh, some of the good uh, what we call uh, practices are that you say, you know, for the first five years it's 10%. For the following five years, it's 12.5 percent. For the following, and it's n it does not relate to the age of your company. It relates to the age of the zone, because at a certain point in time, in 2030, maybe I'm very famous, and people would love actually to 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 sit in my zone, so they would be willing to pay the 20 percent, but not when I'm in my infancy. Y you mentioned Dubai, J Jabal Ali. Register a company in Jabal Ali is now 10,000 dirhams, which is like 3,000 dollars. Register. Registering a company in, in my zone, in our zone, is actually, I used to say $3, now it's $2. So it's, it's you know, so they can afford to make register a company, 10,000 dirham. We're not doing that. They are based on the real estate model. They have zero taxes, but they have very high real estate tax. So it's a, it's a total package. There is a research company. Uh, that is doing us uh, currently a comparative, complete comparative study. Uh, they are a bunch of uh, young researchers. I love them. It's called Infinium. <laughs> yeah, and they are going, they are going to do uh, a complete uh, comparison between, uh, I'm pro younger age. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> uh, so where we are, where the rest of the world are, and, 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 and this is where we can, we, we can do. You're skeptic about economic zones, especially economic Everybody is, and it's true because you know, you, you know, in Egypt, when, when somebody you know plants uh, strawberries, he makes money. The second year, everybody is planting uh, strawberries. We have, we have actually thousands, close to 4,000 industrial zones all over the world. 350 of these claim that they are a special industrial zone. So it became actually what you call a term that I never, you know. I also say, I say Sous Canal Economic Zone. I never mentioned the term we're special or anything. I say, give us a chance and let's sit together and see. Because everybody is claiming that he's very flexible. Everybody is claiming that, uh, you know. Uh, the fourth question that I was never asked is because they distribute my CV. So they know actually, you know, how long it takes to the, you know, I'm, I'm the technology guy. But this probably are for him. Everybody is claiming that he's not very productive. Everybody is claiming that he can do it very fast, everybody. So what will remain actually is that underground, what is happening, and the clusters. This is what we are capitalizing on, the clusters and how we are looking at things. You know, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an invitation by uh, the IT community in Ittisar. I know them very well. They are probably my family. So we were talking about incentives. And I said, it depends. I don't have something It's one size fits all. You know, if, if Toyota says, you, they would like to come, or Hyundai, I would be willing to give the lands for free. Because I will make much more money from other land, other than this land. And then I joked with them and I said, but you guys, you come to me, I will make you pay for the land, because you know, you are not, you are not Toyota. And believe it or not, actually, it was on Wednesday night, so it was not able to catch the Thursday uh, newspaper. Friday morning, my photo, and you know, Darwish, who loves investment. Okay, Dr. Darwish, give them the land for free and make our water and electricity more expensive. Our cup of water and our lamp at home more expensive. So, and this is what? This is Yom Saba, which is owned by Ahmed Abu Hashima, the very liberal guy. So, we're still, you know, we have lots of, uh, of old ideas regarding, you know, our incentive packages, but we're we are ignoring all that. We have a very... Uh, we have a board that's very open-minded and very courageous, and we will do what it takes for an incentive package. Hyundai has an incredible, you know, incentive package from Turkey. If we don't match that, you know, we lost Hyundai. Toyota doesn't have this futuristic plan. I'm not sure about, uh, about uh, Ford. What is the last, the last question, our balance sheet? What is the government is getting back? The government is getting back jobs. The government is getting back GDP. Uh, mm, sort of, uh, we are contributing positively in the in the GDP uh, growth. The government is getting whatever taxes is being paid in the zone, but we don't. It, according to the law, we sit every year and negotiate with the government how much of our surplus 
we will be injecting to close the deficit gap of the budget, and I don't think we'll be giving them, you know, with the Minister of Finance for the first five years, because I have lots of infrastructure that I'm paying and so on, so I don't think any of my surplus will go to the government for the next, uh, for the, at least for the first five years, because we have lots of bills to pay for the first five years. Maybe after five years, some of our surplus will be invested one more time in the zone, and some of our surplus we will give to the government to close their, uh, their budget gap. Thank, thank you, Doctor. Two finger interjections. I'm sorry. Short fingers. Two very short fingers. Uh, the reason why I mention skepticism is uh, really two things. One is, is the tax issue. Uh, because you said 80% of, of the business is going to be export oriented and re export, uh, there's going to be a huge amount of tra uh, transfer pricing, so you're not going to get the 23% regardless of, of this. Thing. The second is because of this whole situation, <coughs> Suez Canal, where it is, and and, and the sphere of influence, uh, influence that you have in there, this, uh, I think you call it the uh, area of coverage. 70% um, uh, of the world economy and trade uh, and flows uh, would be taking place in Asia. And yet we seem to be much more oriented towards Europe and part of the Middle East and Asia, Saudi Arabia and what have you. Um, uh, you're basically addressing the stagnant portion of this. So that's why I think... No, no, I'm addressing... The, no, no, the, I'm, I'm sorry, but this will make me change the slide later on. No, I am addressing... You should. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, I learn a lot from these meetings. I'm addressing from my zone, where are you going, but not where are you coming from. No, of course, you know, the Chinese took seven square kilometers in our land. No, no. I'm getting from Far East and then distributing to... In fact, this is what we are claiming with the Chinese, make us your hub. Unfortunately, we missed lots of opportunities when they were designing their new Silk Road. Uh, their, their anchor in the new Silk Road is Piraeus. It should have been Sokhna or Eastern Porsaid or something like that. So, no, we are addressing that. Make us, you know, your hub for Eastern Africa and for the uh, Middle East. No, no, you're right about I will change. I'll make an in, I'll make an arrow coming in and an another arrow coming out with different colors. No, thank thanks, thanks for the comment. Thank you, Dr. Delvish. Thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, this was a very good meeting. Uh, we will have a little bit more this, this evening. Let me simply say something different we're going to do uh, in the future. The next meeting will be the first Sunday in April 2017. <laughs> So you can all schedule it from now, so we don't have the problem of telling people the last minute. I know everybody's busy. Uh, I don't know what the date will be, but that's going to be when we're going to hold that. Uh, well, it's going to be April 2nd. Whatever. As long as it's not April 1st. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not April 1st, yes. Uh, Leila, you want any announcements left for uh, this evening? Okay, we have a Tahrir dialogue this evening, and then Tahrir dialogue. Yeah. Uh, okay, a Tahrir dialogue this evening, and then uh, a dinner for the advisory board members. Uh, thank you all for being here, and Dr. Darwish again. Thank, thank you very you much. much. It was a golden opportunity for me. Thank you.